Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, today's webinar will be continuation of our last webinars. It will be part four on simultaneous five axes in SolidCamp. And uh, again, this will be given by Amod Ankar, who is our specialist in this field. And before he starts, I'd like to again remind everybody that in May, we have our resellers uh, Salacam World, which will be held in Tuttlingen, Germany. Uh, it is advisable for everyone to register as soon as possible uh, so that you can guarantee that you'll also have a hotel room. All the information is in our resellers area. All you have to do is click on click to register and you'll get all the information that we have down here as far as the agenda, travel and hotel information, and registering for the um, conference as well, for SolidCam World Conference. And uh, again, there's a lot that we'll be doing over there, so sign up as soon as you possibly can. All right, I will now turn this over to Amod, and we will be able to start the webinar. So Amod, you are, Amod, you are now the presenter, and uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, just a moment. Okay. Hi, everyone. And uh, today we are going to talk about and show you some very nice stuff about a very important area in five axis. And uh, that's basically the angle pairs and pole handling. Okay. So we are going to talk today. The entire webinar is dedicated only to these two subjects. These two areas in solid cam actually have been a mystery to many. First of all, it took a long time even for me to understand what really these two mean and what can they affect in the final outcome of the tool path, especially uh, on the machine. So what we are going to do today is we're going to take a couple of simple examples and I'm going to explain to you what each of these things in solid cam actually mean and what difference do they do on the machine okay so i've i've made a presentation in the last few days and uh, i've tried to explain as much as i can uh, about these two areas so uh, let's go through the presentation a uh, few slides first and then we'll move to an example first of all we have this option called as angle pairs and in them we have got few options like minimum angle change the start angle type first angle pair second angle pair and the machine limits okay the machine limits more or less is clear to many of of us but this the first one is a mystery to many of us okay what really they mean and what really they do so in a five axis world of simulation as well as on on real machines any point on the tool path, any point on the part, generally can be accessed in two ways. Now there's a caveat or there's a limitation to this. The limitation is that provided the machine can actually go to that point in either way. So if the machine has a limitation that it can tilt only one side and the other side it cannot, in that case, it can only have one possibility. But in general, any point on the tool path can be accessed by two, two pairs, okay? And that's because the vector of the tool axis orientation can be mapped into two angle pair solutions. You can have plus, you can have minus, and the C angle can rotate. Let's say there is A and C axis. So you can have <coughs> positive A and C0, and you have negative A and C180. So you can have two, two possibilities here. So the machine can do either way. The GPP can do either way. So what should it output is decided by the angle pairs. So what do you have generally? You have the first angle pair and the second angle pair, depending on the machine. Now, the today's, today's machine is going to be a very simple table-table machine, and it's very simple for us to understand what these angle pairs really mean. Okay? So let's go to the part straight away. Uh, I have a part out here. And what I've done is I've simply created a parallel to curve uh, tool path with these surfaces and the upper edge as our 
driving curve. And I just have created a simple single tool path. The tool I'm using is a 10 R2 bullnose. And if I go to the machine control, okay, I have got a second angle pair. Okay, now let's go to our presentation and look at what second angle pair means. So if I'm if I watch or if I look at the machine from the right side, my second angle pair means my A angle will be tilted or my table will be tilted or the part will be tilted towards the operator. And my first angle pair means the part will be tilted away from the operator. Okay, so operator is on the side. So let's look at what the solution looks like now. So let's run the simulation. Yes, please. So you can see that in the second angle pair that we chose, the, the table or the part is tilting towards the operator where my A angle is negative, okay? Now, what I'm going to do here is, I'll click on the first angle pair and run the calculation again, just to understand what exactly is happening. Okay, so let's run the simulation and see what my first angle pair looks like. Okay, now you can see what has happened is it still has brought the whole thing to the front. Why is that? You can look at the A angle out here. The A angle here is minus 36. Okay, and let's look at what our machine is capable of ha handling. So let's switch off this. And if I go to my machine, my machine says my maximum or the minimum limit is minus 30. Okay, so it's 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 already gone out of my uh, angle. So what I'm going to do now is I'll edit this. I'm going to the minimum angle pair and let's calculate. I'm sorry, extremely sorry. It should not be off. In my first angle pair, when I select, and here if I have not selected my machine limits, it is going to go back to the old solution. So I'll put the limits all, and I calculate the first angle pair. Okay, now let's run the simulation. You can see that it tilted out to the next angle out here because now the system knows or SolidCam knows that we have a limitation. I cannot take my A angle on the other side because I've put the limits on now. So it takes the A into the positive side, which can tilt up to 110 and the negative can go only up to minus 30. Okay, so you can see that the first angle pair, the tool tilted away from the operator or the part tilted away from the operator and the second angle pair, the tool or the part tilted towards the operator. Okay, perfect. Now, what I'm going to do is, I, since I've kept this as a first angle pair, I'll also copy this operation and I'll paste it here. And what I will do here is I'll edit this and I'll click on second angle pair, okay? With the limits, let's see how the software deals with the second angle pair. We expect that the two part will now tilt towards the operator, okay? Let's go here. and Let's see what happens. You see this software is pretty smart now. Even if you have selected the second angle pair, since you have switched on the limits, it understands that it cannot go beyond minus 30. And my first A angle in case of a second angle pair was minus 36. That's why it tilted the part again towards the first angle pair, okay? So it's pretty smart. If you have switched on the limits, you can rest be assured that all your machining will happen within the limits specified in your VMID, okay, or, or the machine. Now we'll make a change to our VMID because we like to see what would happen. So instead of minus 30, I will say minus 110. Okay, so I give it a pretty long range. I give it a pretty long rope to work with. Now I'll just click on simulate. Go here. Okay, 
that's because I've not calculated it. Let's edit. Second angle pair. Let's run the calculation. Okay, let's run the simulation now. It still goes back to its first angle pair. We'll see why it happens. Now, I have got my first angle pair out here, okay? And then I've got my second angle pair. Now, what happens if I click on the minimum angle change? Okay, let's run the slide here. When I select the minimum angle change parameter, what it basically does, it forces SolidCam to select the angle pair that is or that is closer to the previous tool paths angle pair so that a large angle difference is not created between the first poster tool path and the second poster tool path. So if I've selected in my case minimum angle change and I have said first or the second angle pair, okay, in my first case, let's do one thing. In my first case, I have not selected the minimum angle change, but I've selected the first angle pair. Okay, in my second tool path, I select a minimum angle change and the second pair, okay? And I'll switch off the limits, in fact. Let's see what happens. Since my limits are off, it's now taking it to the second angle pair because it's on my it's the limits are off now let me switch on the limits again here let me switch on all the limits and run the calculation okay let's run the simulation because the previous one had oops this is something crazy That's because I've not switched on the minimum angle pair in the first place, okay. Now let's calculate again the second one. Okay, let's run the simulation. Okay, now it's on this side, so let me first select both of these tool parts and run the simulation. Okay, that's the first one, and that's the second one. Why is that? That's because some of my limits are going out of range, so it's trying to get everything within the limits. Now, what would generally happen in a real world situation is that if my first tool path has been selected using the first angle pair, and if I've selected the minimum angle change, my second tool path, irrespective of what angle pair I've selected, always will bring it closer to the first angle pair or the situation that was existing in the first tool path, okay? So let's look at the second scenario out here. Let's edit this. And there's another one called as a first, provide the first rotation angle. Now, before we do that, I would like to see what is the C angle here of the of the uh, of this uh, solution. My C is plus ninety eight. Okay, so what I do here is I'll choose the first rotation angle. Now, whatever angle that I put here the system will try, or SolidCam will try, and get it closest to the angle pair that would be closer to that angle. So if I say plus 90, it will keep the same solution that you just saw. But if I say minus 90, let's look at what it will do now. Let's run the simulation. When I said minus 90, my second angle pair, or, the, or rather the first angle pair, the C-axis was minus 81. So what it does basically is if I say minus 90, minus 81 is more closer to minus 90 than plus 90, right? So what it did was it brought it 
it brought or it used the first angle pair so it brought the solution closer to the first angle pair okay so that's basically what the uh, angle pairs do out here so you can the user can set the preferred start angle for the first and second solution it's either the first angle is always the c axis in most of the cases solid cam will automatically choose a solution that will bring the machine closer to the desired start angle so we saw that my first angle or the first angle pair c axis was minus 81 and i said my first rotation angle is minus 90 so it brought it closer to plus to minus 90. in event that i give this as plus 90 you can have any angle here so it will bring it closer to the solution so if i use it as plus 90 you can see that it will take it to the second angle pair okay that's because plus 98 is closer to plus 90 so it will take it closer to the plus 98 or the second angle pair solution okay right the next one is basically the limit like i said most of the times this this area is pretty clear that when you have when you want the machine limits compliance or you want solid cam to to uh, to be compliant with the machine limits you switch on the limits now within that you have got options like if you would like solid cam to only respect the xyz translation axis you can switch on the translation limits or if you want solid cam to respect only the c and a axis or c and b axis you can switch on the rotation limits and if you switch on limits all it will basically mean that solid cam has to respect the x y z a and c angles now if you switch on that and calculate and if some of some portion of the tool paths are not going to be respected when you generate a gpp or even when you generate the make the calculation they there will be a message that will pop up saying that a certain axis has gone out of limits okay now if the limits all is kept as it is and if you try to post the tool path you'll get again a message you'll only get the header and there will be nothing else in the entire g code the g code comes out mostly blank there will be nothing in that case either you fix your tool path or switch on to lim uh, no limits and generate the g code so i hope the angle pairs are clear we'll move to another very interesting topic okay that's been a mystery again and this has been a bigger mystery for most of us and that's the pole handling okay most of us are not uh, are clueless about what it really does what but trust me it's a very interesting thing and a lot of our issues that you probably see on the machines will get sorted out once we understand what pole handling really does pole handling or singularity okay it's also called a singularity in five axis it's a situation when you have your rotary axis vector is parallel to the tool axis okay in the tip in, in a table table kind of a machine the c axis vector is parallel to z axis which is basically the tool axis or let's say let's take a case of the dmu 100 monoblock machine where you have got a rotary along x in that case the tool axis will become parallel to a and that that will create a singularity when you have such a situation where it comes into a singular position where the c axis and the tool axis are in in the singular or in the pole position there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of solutions that can work for example the tool could be stationary the part could rotate or the part could be stationary and the tool could rotate or both of them could rotate around each other still create a solution because all of these three will still create a valid solution so which one is actually going to be right for you will will be decided by the options that we see in the next slide for example the first one which says freeze around pole well if you have seen the movies and when the cops say freeze that means people raise both of their hands together and they stand at one position and this is exactly what happens on the machine when you say freeze the part is stationary and the tool will just move around the part as as 
seen in this video. You can see that the part is stationary and the tool is going to just move around the part. It's like creating a simple three axis machining solution. Okay. In the next option, or in, rather in this option, SolidCAM converts a rotation axis into a linear axis and machines the part like three axis. Remember that the very first solution that uh, SolidCAM will consider in any of the situations of pole when, when it comes into the pole singularity is that it will try and machine it in three axis as much as it can. Okay, that is its first priority. So you can actually force solid cam not to take the route but to take some other route by changing the options in the uh, pole handling uh, method in the second method we have use rotation axis to stay around pole within the linear axis now this is a bit tricky the one on the left okay so what we are going to do is let's open a part it's much more easier to explain on the part I'll pass on this uh, uh, this presentation to you. You can look at the presentation. It has got movies in it. Okay. So I have this tool path out here. What I've done is I've just generated a parallel to curve tool path. Okay. My geometry is this face out here. And this is my edge curve. And what is the singularity or the one I have used here is rot rotate the angle around pole to stay within the linear limits. Now, it's pretty clear what it means. It says that solid cam should try and find a solution. The first solution is just check if you can move around the part in simple three axis when it is possible, when you do not violate any of the translation limits. You don't violate the limits of X, you don't violate the limits of Y. If any one of these limits are violated, then you switch to keeping the tool stationary and rotating the part around the tool. So what we are going to do now, let me just check what is the Y axis limit in this case. It's minus 500 plus 500. So what I will do is run the simulation. This part is pretty small, so you can see that it is sitting much inside the limits. So if I run the simulation for this, you can see that it just did simple three-axis motion. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to force a limit to this machine. I'll go to y-axis and I'll say my y cannot move. It's zero. Let's save. Let's edit, just save and calculate. The same solution, okay, use rotation angle around pole will now give me a completely different result on the machine. Okay, so here is the machine, the same part, everything is same, I just had changed the singularity option, uh, the limits on the machine, and you can see what is gonna happen now. Because it was going to violate the y-axis limit because it can't move in y-axis So the only option now left for it is to rotate the part. Okay, so Here you saw two act two possibilities of a singularity you it could move around the part in the translate using the X and Y and X and Y axis or It could freeze it It could freeze all the linear axis and just rotate the part keeping the tool stationary in such a way that it would not violate any of the axis, uh, translation axis. For example, it did not violate X, it did not violate Y. It could have violated X because it still has got a possibility to move around, but because Y has, not, has got no possibility to move, I've set it at zero, the only way was to keep Y stationary and rotate the part completely to finish the machining. Okay, let's move to the next option. And this option, again, it's pretty nice. Again, very uh, mystery. It, it was a big mystery what it basically does. It's called as a linear interpolation of rotation axis around pole. 
So what this basically does, if I have to put it in a simple explanation, I know it's going to be a bit confu confusing unless and until you don't see what is actually happening on the machine. But if you want to take a theoretical explanation of this particular option, with this option, the axis of the rotation axis transition has a constant speed or the rotation axis has the constant speed. In this case, C axis, when it moves from point A to point B, point B to point C, point C to point D, will have constant speed, okay? That means it goes from one point to the other by keeping the field constant, okay? Now, it's, it's, it's a bit confusing unless and until you don't watch what is happening. So I'll go to one of these parts here. So what I have, I have a five axis solution here. Okay, let's go to the front view. I've got a five axis solution coming right up to this point. And after this point, you can see that it's a flat plane. So it has to convert from five axis to a simple three axis. Again, my three axis solution will end here. And from here, it moves to five axis again. So let's assume that this is point A, there is point B, and there are, let's say, four or five points in between. So point B, point C, point D, point E, and point F. So point B to point F are basically three axis uh, motions. And from point F to point G is a five axis motion. So let's say this was C100 or C0. This was C100. And from C100, it needs to move to C200. So what it is going to do basically is it will divide that C motions into B, C, D, E, and F. So it will divide it into five. So basically 20 degrees each. And it will rotate with a constant speed from B, uh, C100 to C120, C120 to C140, and so on till it comes to this position. And from there, it will switch on to the five axis speed rate. Okay, so when you see on the machine what actually happens on this flat plane, you will see that the part suddenly starts moving to another area. Okay, that's basically because it's trying to convert these points into linear motions and it's going to apply the linear feed also to the rotary. So let's edit this toolpath and let's see what is the option set for this. Okay, it's linear interpolation. So let's run the simulation. Let's go to the machine simulation. And here I will not switch on the direct simulation. You can see that I've moved the part away from the center of the table just to show you what exactly happens on those two points. So here, again, it's a five axis solution. You can see that the table is moving. Still moving. You can see the B axis changing. The C is constant at 180. So my point A started at 180 degrees and it's going to point B all the way to 180 degrees. Once it comes into the pole, okay? Now, what is a pole? A pole is defined by another value there. I'll, I'll show you that value. Once it comes into the pole position, it still not hit the pole position. Now it hits the pole position. You can see that now it starts moving the C axis because it's simple three axis motions for it. It can either go in a simple three axis or it could just move the C axis to move from point B to point C. So now it's moving from point B to point C. Look at the speed at which it moves from point B to point C. Okay, it's going from point C to point D now. You can look at the speed, why? Because it's keeping the feed rate constant, okay? Feed rate of linear axis is applied also to the rotary axis. Okay, once it finishes its position, once it comes to that point F, you can see that the feed is again dropped and it moves in the five axis feed rate. Okay, so this, this is basically about the linear interpolation of axis. Okay, so if you really look into the uh, speed, 
So if I put it in the beginning, you can see that when it traverses from B to F, it's pretty quick. That's it. That's how it will traverse even on the machine. And then it'll again slow down and run the uh, cutting. Now I'll change the option to smooth interpolation of rotation angle around pole, okay? Once I do that, okay, I was also talking to you about what is a what angle is to be considered as pole. Generally, the pole is considered at zero, okay? Basically, when the two vectors are parallel, the tool axis vector as well as the rotary axis vectors are parallel, that means when we have one of the swivel axis at zero, we consider that to be a pole. However, there's a pole angle tolerance, which means that up to a certain degree, it can still behave like a pole position. So if I put a value of 0.1 here, up to 0.1 degree in swivel, it'll behave like a pole and it'll apply the pole handling method to that particular situation. Generally, it's not a good idea to apply a very coarse tolerance. You'll see that in most cases, in by default, we'll have this up, this value as our uh, pole tolerance. This is not a good value. A better value would be about one micron. It'll give you the uh, it'll give you much better results. But however, there is another problem by for giving uh, such close values. You will see a lot of times the c-axis moving idle along with the tool. Okay. And that is because it's considering most of the things as uh, the the pole. Okay, it's it's considering that that particular situation is coming into the pole because at one micron, it a lot of points can come into the pole position. Okay, but if you increase the tolerance, you have the, you run the risk of skipping some areas, or skipping some points, which could be dangerous. Okay, it's always better to have some idling motion with the c-axis rather than skip some points and directly cut something that could either damage the part or it could make the part useless because it could uh, fail in the inspection at the end. Okay, so let's assume that it the value of one micron is a decent acceptable value for pole handling. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I've changed the option to smooth interpolation of rotation angle around the pole. What does this do? Now, if you look at, while it's calculating, if you look at the theoretical explanation, the smooth, with the smooth interpolation, rotation axis transition will, be, will perform the transition with an acceleration and deceleration. That means the cyst solid cam will consider the acceleration and deceleration of the c-axis okay it it will perfectly understand that c-axis is not a linear axis and it cannot apply the linear feed rate to c-axis so it will perform the transition from point b to point f using the acceleration and deceleration and it's it's going to be very clear when we run the simulation you'll see the difference straight away okay you're here back again and let's run the simulation for some people there would be problem in uh, looking at the simulation because the frame rate refresh on go to meeting is a bit slow but i'll just stop it when it comes into the pole position and then we'll move manually Okay, it's coming into the pole position now. Okay, it's now into the pole position. If, if you remember what happened in the earlier example when it was converted to linear motion, and now it's converted to smooth motion. So you can see the difference now in the C-axis motions. You can see that now the C-axis is moving much slower than it did with the linear motion. Why? Because now it has interpolated using the acceleration and deceleration of c-axis what this basically means is that it's putting too many points or too many c-motions so that the movement is going to be very smooth when it goes uh, on, on the machine okay instead of putting motions at every 10 degrees it's now putting it at every 0.5 or 0.6 degrees 
okay once that once the pull position is over it'll get back again to the machining with with the five axis so you saw that when it moved from point b to point f the movement was very gradual and very smooth that that's because it put several points in between to make sure that there is no sudden acceleration and no sudden deceleration it's pretty smooth when you traverse on those points by default in solid cam the option of smooth transition is always on unless you want to change it to some other option okay let's go back again to our toolpath out here one of these this one if I edit this and if I go into the control we have the last option and that's the force stable rotation that means irrespective of whether you're going to have limits compliance or not I want to force the C axis to move and the tool to remain stationary okay let's calculate Let's run the simulation. Okay. You can see that since it has not done any compliance violation, it will still treat it as a three axis toolpath. Now, what I will do here is instead of providing a simple solution, instead of 90 degrees, I will say, provide me a tilt of 89.9 and now let's run the solution you can see what happened here it's no longer going to consider the three axis solution because three axis now will violate everything so what it is going to do is it's simply going to rotate the c axis keeping the tool stationary and we can force the table to rotate in this case Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's run to another portion of the uh, pole handling, and that is the uh, tool repositioning. Many a times you might have seen that the toolpath looks very nice in solid cam. Okay. It looks pretty nice in solid cam. But when you take it to the machine, or when you take it to the machine simulation, you see there are a lot of retracts. One of the reasons why there is a retract is because there is a limitation in rotation of one of the axes, and in order to overcome that, the tool has been retracted, the part has been allowed to rewind and come back to the same position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force the C axis to go from zero to 360 only. So I'm going to force a limitation in my C table. And this is the tool path that I have. So if I now run the simulation, if I go to the machine simulation, the tool path looks nice. If I take it into my machine simulation, the tool path also looks nice. However, if I go into the analysis and instead of initial tool path, I click on tool number, you can see what has actually happened on the machine. That's the tool path, and that's where it is taking the tool retract to. Okay, this distance is defined by the distance in the uh, tool repositioning, which is about 100 millimeters. So it's pulling the tool path up here, doing the rewind, and then coming back to the same position. So, so if I run the simulation slowly, you can see that it finishes one rotation because it's hit the limit. It retracts, goes up to the clearance plane of 100, re rewinds again, comes back again. And when, it's, when it does a rewind, you can see that it's doing the rewind every 10 degrees. Okay, so it's doing the rewind every 10 degrees. Now, what is that that is controlling? That 10 degrees is being controlled by this parameter here. Okay, so if I switch off this value and if I run the calculation here, I don't want the angle 
to be set. Let's run the simulation. Go to the machine simulation. Okay. And now if I again go to the analysis and look at the tool number, you can see that it just retracts. There is no angle. Why? Because it moves that entire angle of 360 in one go. There will be only a single command. In some machines, this, this is pretty good because you're anyway out of the part. So why to have unnecessary uh, blocks? But in some cases, especially when you are close to a fixture and all, it is very important to give that incremental angles. Okay, so you can see that it's pulled up. And once it goes up, I'll just stop it. Okay, you can see that from 360, it came back to zero again. Okay, so it was just one rotation that it created, and that's it. So it rewinds to 360 back again, and that's that's it. It just keeps continuing. There's there's no longer any uh, motions on the top that you see. But if I change this angle, let's say to 45 degree, and run the calculation. Let's run the machine simulation again. Okay, and let's go into the analysis to lumber. You can see what it created. If I look from top, you can see 45 degree, 45 degree, 45 degree, 45. It's like a, it's like a, a polygon that is, it has created. So if I run the simulation again now, it will rotate. And if I go into the move list, if I go up, okay, so it's come down to 360. From 360, next one is 315, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, 45, 45, 45, 45, and zero. Okay, so that particular value will control how the angles are going to be mapped or how the angles are going to be distributed when it withdraw or pulls it out to the uh, uh, clearance plane and that value is out here. It's 100 millimeter Let me change this c-axis back again to minus 99999 and Plus 9999 Okay, it's done. Let's save this and Let's run the same uh, Simulation again Okay, and now if I go to the analysis to the tool number, you can see that there are no longer retractions because we now don't have any limit in C axis and this whole machining can now be done without retracting any any of the tool or any of the motions to the clear, uh, clear plane and then rewinding it because we are still going to be within the limit when the tool path completes. All right, let's stop this. And let's go to another very interesting uh, area. And that area is uh, basically our point interpolation. So let me open another part. OK. There are two options out here. And what they do basically is was also a mystery. However, it's no longer a mystery provided you understand what they basically do. The first one here was interpolation of vectors and interpolation of machine angles. It's pretty simple. What basically interpolation of vectors means that the motion or the, 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 the motion between two points on a segment, okay? Point A to point B. The way the motion is created will be defined by either one of these options. If the motion is done generally with the shortest distance, which is generally a line, okay, from point A to point B, shortest distance, then that particular motion would have been generated by interpolation of vectors, basically on a flat plane, okay? It's just a simple, from point A to point B, a simple line. But if it needs to take into account the machine kinematics, 
okay defined in our vmid in that case we need to use the linear interpolation of machining angles here it's not a simple point a to point b a line kind of a mo movement it could be much smoother than that it could be a spline it could be a spline movement between point a to point b much smoother so in even that you're trying to machine a part on the machine by default keep the linear interpolation of machine angles in your toolpath you'll always get a much smoother motion you'll get much constant or consistent angles in your g code you won't have those small variations coming in the g code okay right having said that let's move to the next one and in the next one we have got the interpolation of points okay now what it basically does so let me edit this toolpath and run the machine simulation because this currently is without anything so i'm going to go into the machine machine simulation and let's observe yes please we will observe how the toolpath looks like okay we are not bothered about the angle pair but i would like to see how the toolpath looks like now i would like to look at the vectors of this toolpath okay so i'll switch on the tool vectors and let me go to the options simulation properties and the tool vector i would like to change it to 50. okay so i get much longer vectors out here you can see that i'm getting the tool vectors only in the areas where there is a change of angle happening okay so let's go back let's rerun this toolpath with second angle pair and let's run the simulation now yes please okay now if i run the simulation you can see that the c angle now is constant okay the c angle is constant it jumped from that point straight away to the end because it's a straight line so it now is trying to do the interpolation and once it completes the interpolation it's simple line again okay now you can do two things to make this motion much smoother because you're going to have uh, what we call as uh, acceleration and a immediate deacceleration so you will see that in this area the finish is not great okay because the tool is trying to accelerate suddenly and suddenly it de deaccelerates there are two ways to handle this one is you could go into the tool parameters and set the distance as one okay now what happens here if i go into the machine simulation yes please you will see that it has created tool vectors even on the straight point so even though the c angle is really not changing it is still created tool vectors that means i'm going to get this point even if the c angle is not changing okay i'll keep getting this point i can create a much better situation than this okay and that situation is to switch off this point distribution and go into the point interpolation and ask for uh, additional point to be added at every one millimeter without changing the tool or without adding a tool vector to it okay so you'll see that once i add that and i go into the machine simulation i will still create a similar looking tool path but without any tool vectors you can see that i don't have any tool vectors in in between those changeover positions however you can see that the tool still behaves exactly the same way and the c-axis will keep moving so that there won't be a sudden change in the c-axis rotation okay you can see that c-axis changing out here now if i actually generate an output of this toolpath the g code yes please let's look at the total number of blocks we have double three double five okay and i'll switch off this and i'll switch on the distance here i'll calculate this toolpath and generate the g code yes it's the same so the effect is the same without adding additional tool vectors using the point interpolation now since this example was pretty simple 
the effect of interpolation angle step will not be seen because there's no real change in the angle happening on the straight areas but if your example was a bit complex then you could actually see a difference even with the angle step okay you could see that even if the angle is going like point a to point b was 10 degrees it will add additional motions in between to see that the angle change doesn't exceed more than one degree the effect will be probably the same okay but without any additional tool vectors that are being added in between all right so today's was a much shorter kind of a webinar when you consider what happened in the previous four uh, three of the webinars but i believe that i've covered the angle pairs and the uh, pole handling and it's much more clear to you now uh, these examples again will be sent to you along with the presentation that I've created with the movies and the embedded into the presentation So we can have actually a look at it and work with it And I'm I'm pretty much sure now that you will actually go and revisit some of your parts that you have already done To see what is the effect of pole handling or angle pairs that is go that's going to happen on those parts when you change certain options all right uh, I'm done with the webinar today and if you have any questions you can ask me either here or you could put put the questions across to me on my Skype and I'll try or my email and try my best to answer it as quickly and as fast as I can thank you very much for uh, hearing me and listening me and watching me today okay thank you very much Amod uh, as far as the parts goes the moment that I will get the parts from Amod I will uh, attach them to our website together with the recorded webinar, and you'll be able to download it at that point. Okay, thank you again, everyone, for joining our webinars. And a quick reminder again, don't forget to register for the SolidCam World in Germany in May. All right, take care, everyone, and have a phenomenal weekend.